And welcome to our webinar on getting started with electromagnetic simulation. We're going to go through just a brief introduction to kind of, you know, what is electromagnetic simulation, and then I'll do a short demo on actually doing an electromagnetic simulation inside of Maxwell. For those of you who aren't familiar, CA Associates uh, is an engineering consulting firm in Middlebury, Connecticut, and we specialize in finite element analysis, CFD analysis, and electromagnetic analysis. And we've been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985. If you haven't ever, I recommend that you take a look at our website, caeai.com. We have a uh, resource library, has things like macros, extensions, um, white papers and things that are very useful uh, for learning how to do different kinds of analyses or improving your analyses. We have our Engineering Advantage blog uh, where we, all the uh, engineers here at CA Associates contribute some interesting information about engineering in general, finite element analysis, etc. You can also uh, look at our training calendar there. Um, we have an extensive schedule of courses, and if you're wondering which courses to take, check out the CAE University, help you decide which group of training classes is best for you. Um, this session is being recorded, and we will post the session on YouTube along with all of our other uh, videos and webinars that we've done, so I invite you to check out our YouTube channel. It's got a complete library of uh, instructional videos and tutorials to help with uh, you using ANSYS. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A window or the chat window in the WebEx, and I will address them at the end of the webinar rather than uh, stopping the webinar to answer questions. All right. So why do we want to do electromagnetic analysis? Well, same as any simulation that we're doing, our goal here is to gain a better understanding of the response and behavior of some electromagnetic device. Virtual prototyping, always less expensive than actual prototyping. We don't want to get into the build it and break it type of uh, scenarios. Also, virtual prototyping is safer. You know, some electromagnetic simulations such as short circuit and things can be catastrophic and obviously result in very dangerous tests. Virtual prototyping also allows us to do design sensitivity studies. Rather than having just one prototype, we can actually investigate a whole bunch of different scenarios uh, with a simulation. We can look at changes in the loading, changes in the environment, et cetera, and see how that affects our design. Things that we can solve in electromagnetic analysis, certainly not limited to these. These are just some examples. A capacitor, compute the electric field between and around the conducting plates, calculate the capacitance. Uh, an example of that would be brakes in an electric car. If we're trying to regain some energy from the braking, those, that would be stored in a capacitor. Uh, we can analyze motors and generators. We can analyze the magnetic field in a motor due to the uh, coil windings or permanent magnets. We can look at fringing effects and look at field results. Uh, we can calculate things like the flux linkage, inductance, reactance, the force and the torque in the motor. Solenoid, we can analyze the magnetic field and calculate the forces and torque generated in a solenoid. If you want to look at like a car starter, essentially a solenoid. Um, high voltage insulator, another one, simulate the electric field in, in lossy dielectrics. We're generating uh, heat, generating, um, calculate the current density and the joule heated, joule heating effects in those uh, materials. Many electromagnetic uh, simulations, just like all simulations, are really coupled field simulations. So uh, we need to solve the electromagnetic problem in conjunction with other field solutions. For example, in this example, um, did a uh, performance analysis of an electric motor, and we found that you know if we look at the torque using uh, looking at the electric motor at room temperature constant 22 degrees, we get the red lines here, and you know you got pretty good response. We found that if you feed back the or if we feed the results of the electric calculation into a thermal calculation, actually calculate the heat up of the parts, and then to redo the electric.
metric analysis, often in an iterative fashion, we found that we got much worse performance. We had a 16% drop in performance when we included the effect of the couple field, the fact that the temperatures are affecting the electromagnetic response. So it's important to consider a uh, couple fields when we're talking about electromagnetic and most analyses, really. So to do electromagnetic analysis, we're going to take a look at the, pro the ANSYS Maxwell program. ANSYS Maxwell is an industry-leading, high-performance, interactive software package that uses finite element analysis to solve the electric and or magnetic problems. Electromagnetic problems are solved using Maxwell's equations in a finite region of space with the appropriate boundary conditions and excitations in order to obtain a solution. Um, we can solve different types of problems, electrostatic, magnetostatic, eddy current, magnetic transient. We can get things like all the field parameters, the electric field, the magnetic field, the force and torque, capacitance, inductance, etc. Um, Maxwell's strengths, number one, is easy to use. It has adaptive mesh technology. Even if you're not sure what a good mesh is, Maxwell automatically refine the mesh where needed to get a solution within a certain percent error. Um, if you're doing uh, electric machines, electric motors, electric generators, it has an automated workflow set up to automatically build the model of that machine. Um, we can couple things like uh, rigid motion, we can sign that, along with circuit coupling. We can drive our problem from a circuit in Maxwell. And as I mentioned, multi-physics, we can, Maxwell integrates with Workbench, right in the Workbench project page, and therefore we can, via drag and drop, uh, transfer the loads and results from Maxwell into other physics and vice versa. It also lets us look at parametric variations using Design Explorer, investigate a whole series of different analyses with parametric variations to the inputs uh, using the Workbench um, Parameter Manager. Maxwell has advanced material modeling, permanent magnet, magnetization and demagnetization, uh, temperature dependency, core loss calculations. Um, Maxwell also supports multiple processors. We can use multiple cores to solve things like frequency sweeps. The frequencies are essentially independent. We can solve, rather than solve the frequencies in series, we'll just solve them all simultaneously. And same thing with parametric variations. If we have a bunch of different parametric variations, Maxwell can use multiple cores to solve the different parametric variations. Um, different types, different examples of some different electromagnetic analyses in Maxwell. This is an example of a magnetic transient with motion and an embedded circuit to drive the uh, response of this motor. So we actually, most of the motion in Maxwell is prescribed. We're solving essentially the field response at a bunch of different positions of the motor. All that is set up automatically, and we can plot essentially an animation of the full transient. Um, we can use this to predict the motor performance, um, things like core loss, hysteresis, demagnetization can all be predicted. And, of course, this leads to uh, better prediction. Uh, we can more efficiently design our motor. As I mentioned, parametric anal uh, HPC analysis, we can do uh, as many cores as you have. We can run a bunch of different parametric variations. So if we're looking at uh, dozens of different parametric variations in the model, we have dozens of cores, we can run those all simultaneously, and then we can reduce our solution time from months down to days, really, by solving many different variations of a model simultaneously using multiple cores on a system. As I mentioned, Maxwell is easy to use. It integrates with Workbench. We drag and drop on the Workbench project page. Uh, it can use the Workbench CAD tool. So we can take geometry from Design Modeler or from SpaceClaim and bring that into Maxwell. We can use the Workbench Parameter Manager to investigate different variations in, the, in 
parametric uh, changes to the model. When we open Maxwell, probably looks like a lot of other finite element codes used. We have our tree over here. They call it the project manager window. Depending on what we click on there, we'll see some properties in the properties window. Um, we have what they call a history tree. I'm not sure that's the best name for it, but it basically this is your geometry and items in there. So we can click on different geometry items in the history tree, whereas the project manager is where we tell it what type of analysis we're doing and the excitations and boundary conditions for that analysis. We have the message window, we have a progress window, we have the toolbars with dozens of different toolbar buttons, and of course the menu bar in there. When we start Maxwell, um, we can start as a 2D analysis or a 3D analysis. Uh, 3D analysis, we can have the analysis can be magnetostatic, an eddy current analysis, a transient analysis. We can do an electrostatic, essentially it's just having a charge on there, um, or DC conduction or electric transient. And in 2D, we can work in either planar or axisymmetric and do the same kinds of things, magnetostatic, eddy current, transient, electrostatic. In 2D, we can also do AC conduction or DC conduction. Um, these are just the different solvers that are available, as I said, what each one is. Magnetostatic solves for magnetic fields caused by DC currents or permanent magnets. Eddy current solver solves for sinusoidally varying magnetic fields in a frequency domain. Um, if, since it's harmonic, our story can only allow for linear materials. Um, it considers displacement currents, induced fields such as skin effects and current proximity effects are considered. The transient magnetic is a transient analysis, time varying or moving electrical fields. And permanent magnets, it allows for both linear and nonlinear magnetic materials. Electric solvers, um, some of the thing, electrostatic is essentially a charge. DC conduction solves the voltage and electric field due to the potential drop. AC conduction in 2D solves for sinusoidally varying electric fields and transient electric, sinus or transient uh, time varying voltages, charges, or current excitations. So in Maxwell, like most things, we start with the geometry. Geometry can be built in Maxwell or it could be brought in from your CAD system through Workbench, either Design Modeler or directly in from Workbench. And we can use and often do a combination of both techniques. So we'll bring in geometry from a CAD package, we'll add or change things in Maxwell to uh, account for that. We have an extensive built-in material library in Maxwell, all kinds of different materials, and of course you can define your own material and add it to the library if you want. We've got the geometry, we can assign material, then we've got to define the excitation. We can drive the analysis with a current, it's most common, define the current going through a conductor. We can also define current density, or we can define voltage um, across a conductor. Boundary conditions are on the exterior of the model. What happens on the exterior for 3D? The default um, says that the H field is tangential to the boundary and the flux cannot cross that boundary. If we want, if we have this uh, model that's placed in a specific field, we can specify the boundaries that the, there's a, far, a value of the field on the surfaces, or we can specify a boundary, an internal boundary, an insulating boundary to be used uh, to insulate two conductors which are in contact with each other. 2D, it's pretty simple. The vector potential says the magnetic vector potential on the boundary is zero. Essentially, it's isolated. Or we can do a balloon boundary condition, which basically is like an infinite boundary and allows the field to extend past the uh, region that you've modeled. Then we go to meshing. Maxwell, as I said, has automatic mesh generation and adaptive mesh uh, capabilities. So we don't generally have to worry about setting the mesh too much. It's going to automatically adapt the mesh to give us a fine mesh where needed. In electric 
electromagnetic analysis that's often on the surface, especially when we have eddy currents involved. Um, so Maxwell will do that automatically for all analyses except a transient analysis. So for eddy current and static analyses, it will automatically do mesh adaptivity. We often first do a static analysis to start the transient, then we'll use that mesh for the transient analysis. And then post-processing. Once we solve it, we can look at the different fields, magnetic field, electric field, et cetera. We can generate reports. We could do calculations on the fields. We can, of course, have output variables. Well, we saw input variables and get a summary. So to show you this, I'd like to do a quick demo in Maxwell. So we'll, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to do have a new induction stove at home, and I thought I'd do an analysis of an induction heating. Uh, so we have an induction heating coil that's going to have a current running through it, and on top of it we've got a frying pan, a cast iron skillet. So we're going to do this. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to take this as 2D slice. We want to be able to get you all out of this webinar in a reasonable amount of time. So we're going to do this as an axisymmetric analysis. I've taken a 2D slice. So let's go ahead and take a look at that in Maxwell. I've got that 2D geometry here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a Maxwell, uh, 2D Maxwell simulation to the Workbench project. And I'm going to tell it that I want to use this geometry in Maxwell. I'm going to go ahead and refresh this geometry. And this will just take a second to basically import the geometry from Design Modeler, or it could be a CAD package if you're using a CAD package import that into the Maxwell program. And as soon as that finishes, we'll open up Maxwell and take a look at that. Give it maybe another second. There we go. And I'll just double click to open up Maxwell. Now you see here, it doesn't look like there's anything in here. We might worry, but don't worry. If we go here, uh, we've got a 2D. However, it thinks we're doing analysis in the XY plane. So what I have to do here is I have to go and tell it the solution type is actually cylindrical about Z. Also, induction heating stove is done by uh, very high frequency oscillations in the current. So we're actually going to do an eddy current analysis here. I say OK. And there's my model. Now we can see it. We just reoriented the view. I look at the geometry that came in, and we see that all the geometry is initially set as not assigned. So the first thing I got to do is assign some material properties. I'm going to select the coils, and I'm going to give them a material of copper. And the pan, I'm going to assign a material of cast iron. Um, I often like to do some other things here. I'm going to change the color of the coil. Copper is kind of an orangey color, so we'll assign orange to those coils, just so we see some difference there. The other thing that we have to remember for an electromagnetic analysis is that we actually need the air domain, air or vacuum domain surrounding this thing, which was not included in the design modeler geometry. So I'm going to go ahead and just create that here. I'm going to go and say draw a rectangle. And we'll draw a rectangle. Let's see, probably about there is good enough. You'll notice this is assigned a vacuum. For electromagnetic tents, a vacuum is pretty much the same as air. So we're just going to leave that as a vacuum. Um, we can change the color of this if we want. We'll make it a light blue, make it look like surrounding air. So we click on things. So there's my model. That's all the geometry. I've got the material properties assigned. So now what I want to do is I want to go in here and I want to assign some boundary conditions. So the coils, I'm going to select them all, and I'm going to assign an excitation current. And I could type a number in here, but I'm actually going to type a uh, parameter name. I call it amps. I say OK, and this is how you define a parameter in Maxwell. We simply type in a name, and it comes up and says, OK, I'm assuming that's a variable. What's the value for this variable? I'm going to say it's 30. And the reason I did that is, see, when we do the excitations, it adds individual excitations for each of these uh, 
current bodies there. And unfortunately, I can't highlight more than one to change it. So if I wanted to change the current on these, I'd have to highlight each of them and type in the new current. That would be a pain in the neck. Since I have a parameter, I can always just go and change the value of that parameter to the new value. Um, we also need, uh, we, when we do an eddy current analysis, we need to tell it which bodies eddy current should be included on, and we're going to include them on all the coils as well as the pan. The other thing we need is the far field boundary. So I'm going to select the exterior edges of the air domain. This is the axis of symmetry, so we're not going to include that one. And we're going to assign a balloon boundary on there, basically telling it this is an infinite boundary there. OK, so essentially, that's the analysis is set up, ready to solve. We're going to go to the analysis, and we'll add a solution setup. This is the adaptive meshing. We're going to let it do up to 20 different 20 passes. Percent error, looking for 1%, less than a percent error in the energy, and we'll look at that after. The other thing that we need to do in the solver for an eddy current analysis is we need to tell it what is the frequency that this is run at. And in this case, we're going to run, as I said, at a very high frequency. We're going to do a 40 kilohertz here. And we say OK. And I think I'm ready to solve. But just in case, I'm going to click this button here, which says, does a check. Make sure your model seems to be correctly set up for solving. It says it is. So we'll go ahead and we'll click the Analyze All button. And we can see it's very fast. Notice it's already done eight passes, in other words, eight mesh refinements. But as we get finer and finer, each pass gets a little slower and slower. Now we're up to pass 13. The mesh is getting finer, so it takes a little longer to solve. And hopefully we'll get to a converged solution reasonably soon, and it appears we have. So we can go in here on results. We can look at the solution data. We can see this says it took 15 passes. The mesh started off with just 227 elements, wound up with almost 15,000 elements. The percent error in the energy is down below, is about 0 0.7, 0 0.76. So we're considered converged. If we want to see what the mesh looked like at the end, we can take, whoops. Going to plot that on bodies, and we'll plot the mesh. You can see it automatically figured out, based on each previous solution, where it needed a fine mesh. And we'll see that it needs a very fine mesh. The skin depth on the cast iron pan is very small because of the high frequency. So we needed a very fine mesh on the bottom of that pan. We can look at other results. Let's take a look at the magnetic field. Keep doing that. We've got to remember to plot results on something. And there's the magnetic field. It's hard to see, so what we'll do is we'll turn off the mesh. And you can see the magnetic field is pretty much concentrated in the um, it's concentrated in the bottom of the pan, as we said. So if we click on the magnetic field there, you can see the bottom of the pan is where the magnetic field is, essentially. We can look at other things. Let's take a look at the flux lines. Um, let me just make sure I select everything. Field, the flux lines, OK. And by default, it overlays each plot, so you can turn off one or the other or combine them. And then we can see the flux lines in here. Um, and again, concentrated at the bottom of the pan. But the, um, the results that I'm really interested in is, of course, how is the pan being heated up? So let's take a look at one other field. And in this case, I actually just want to look at it on the pan. And that field is the ohmic loss. Essentially, the losses are the heat generation. So if we do that, turn these off. Look at the ohmic loss. And again, once again, concentrated in the bottom of the pan. And we can see our ohmic loss in the bottom of the pan ranges uh, you know, up 
to 2.2 easy eighth watts per meter cubed. That's good, but I don't know essentially what watts per meter cubed is. I want to know how much heat is generated. So to get that information, what we can do is we can use the calculator. I can say I would like to look at the ohmic loss on the geometry of the pan, and I want to integrate it over the geometry in the RZ domain, and I say evaluate, and it tells me that the total watts generated here is 643 watts. That's how much this coil at this frequency and a current of 30 amps generates in that pan. So let's take a quick look here. Let's go back. So we have my Maxwell solution. I'm going to go back to the workbench project. I'm going to take that Maxwell solution, and I'm going to drop it on this thermal transient solution that I've already got set up. Let's do a quick update there, and a refresh here. And it should be importing that. Done. Yep, so we'll go into the thermal transient. Thermal only includes the pan. I'm not interested in the coil here. I'm going to take that imported load and apply it as a heat generation on the pan, obviously. And we'll go ahead and import that load. You can see there's the heat generation is again concentrated at the bottom of the pan. I can look at the summary and we can see 643 watts was imported, which is good. And we can go and we can solve this with that heat generation. I've already got some other loads. And we're going to solve a thermal transient over two minutes. So I want to turn on the induction stove, let it heat up for two minutes, and see how hot the pan gets. And it tells me that you know the center of the pan here is almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit, hopefully good enough to start cooking my scrambled eggs in my cast iron skillet. So that's my demonstration for... Um, Maxwell and really showing how it could be coupled with other analyses using the workbench